Hello Internet, Dave here. In this philosophy video, it is general philosophy looking at knowledge. I'm going to be using multiple sources for this one, Greek mainly and Western rather than my normal Zen from Eastern philosophy. I hope that you enjoy this video. So to begin with, we are going to knock on knowledge. Knowledge, what is it? what it requires and what it confers is indisputably central to the enterprise of philosophy. It is the subject of that principal branch of philosophy known as emicology, a field that derives its name from the Greek word for knowledge, esplea, upper, or, but all branches are intertwined. None of the others could be least visible if it was not for epistemology. It makes no sense to make claims about what is real or what is valuable in the absence of claims of knowledge. Reality and values may be as they are if we are without knowledge of them. All theorising is vanity. Knowledge is a gateway into the cathedral of philosophy. And yet, some philosophers spend their entire lives outside those gates, and they are not clamouring to get in. Some stand around belittling the credentials of those who would enter. These self-appointed guardians at the gate of knowledge will ask, Why? Are you sure? How do you know? Might it not be otherwise? Though annoying, these sceptics have this one salutary influence, they prevent dogmatation from entering the ideal city. They prove something else too, that knowledge be a way into the fortress of philosophy. Philosophy nevertheless flourishes outside its own gates. Philosophy exists as a question, as a what if before it is established an answer, and makes a bid for knowledge. We will focus on knowledge, the promises none. What we will find here is an assumption of doubts, errors, illusions, bases, a few doubtful but instructional tales, a theory or two, even some myth and legend. Aristotle said that philosophy begins and will always begin in wonder. And there is nothing so productive of wonder as little doubt, except perhaps a big doubt. There are some big doubts, but there are also a few knowledgeable claims. Those who claim, those who claim you will have to try to figure out for yourself, to be sure. Like keys, we open the gates. Here's a little exercise for you. Knowledge is justified truth, belief, that these three concerns have also been denied as unnecessary to knowledge. Can you give examples of knowledge that is not belief, not true, and not justified? Please put your answers in the comments below. A first guess at knowledge. To start, Consider a tentative definition already mooted by Plato. Knowledge is justified true belief. This is intended to work both ways. First, to know something, one must believe it. It must be true. And one must have the justification for believing it. Conversely, whether is believed with justification and true is known, the definition is imperfect. You can supply your own critique and challenge your imagination as suggested, but we can begin by looking at its three main parts. Belief. First, knowledge is a species of belief. Sometimes when challenged, we say, I don't believe it, I know as if knowledge made benefit redundant. 
But belief does not vanish when knowledge arises, unless, indeed, it is a false belief that knowledge replaces. And then the replacement is a truth, true belief. The point is that you, as an individual, cannot know anything unless you believe it. Truth. So, to know a proposition, one must believe it. Yet belief alone is inefficient. For starters, the, per the proposition has to be true. Well, what is true? In Caesaric fashion, we are not asking for examples of truth, but an account of the nature of truth. What does it mean for a proposition to be true in the first place, whether it's to believe or not? This is a metaphorical question, but one of obvious importance to philosophy. We will look at this later. Justification. This is about evidence, not excuses. If you believe a truth by accident, it is not knowledge. The way you get to knowledge is part of knowledge. Justification involves getting a rational account, credible reason to accept or reject a belief. An academic warrant, if you will. Experts are authority, yet it is not their authority rather their expertise that should prompt their advice. Expertise must explain itself, it must reason towards its conclusions, otherwise it is brute authority or fanatical myth. For Plato, a rational account, a logic if you will, was a burden, burden much like this epidemic account of experts. Germanic proof and dictatorial inductions were his ideals of justification, but Plato also told a lot of fanciful stories, myths he presented as merely profitable or similar to truth, such as the myth of Atlantis. As Socrates introduced next, he had his own mysteries, means of justification, notably his inner demon, a divine voice, he obeyed. Socrates was not the first philosopher, but he was one of the first to be killed for his ideals. The first philosophers were physicists, metaphysicals, later learned philosophies, literally meaning the wise, were drawn to Athens the democratic centre of a rising empire, to proffer advice where it mattered. With the wealthy and powerful, the unfees, by dispensing advice and educating the youth in virtue, in virtue and or effortless. Autry and Rhetoric were the PR of those days, were inspira inspirational arts in court and political arena, one established socialist was Parentes, a complex and infatuating figure who has perhaps been emphasised most by his famous line, man is the measure of all things. Mortal anatomy as thinking for yourself. Socrates was often lumbered in the Sociites, but he fit the type Pauline. He charged no fees, cared not for money or power, and tended to follow the argument wherever it led, seeking knowledge rather than effective position. He inscrewed requit devices that divide the audience, trick the mind, and make the weaker argument look stronger. In other words, Socrates did irony, but he would not spin. Instead of the sophistic tag, Socrates would only lay claim to the more modern terms. Philosopher, lover of wisdom. Socrates loved wisdom, but would not pretend to possess it. All he knew, he said, was that he knew nothing. He invited all comers to join him in inquiry. But the search was discovery. 
This is just the process of thinking for oneself, of reasoning out moral and ec economical issues, of not talking, taking hand-me-down ideas for granted, nor plausible answers for good enough. To Socrates, truth and virtue were the same. He held that no one ever does evil intentionally, but only by mistake in what is good or right, by thinking for ourselves, by striving for moral automaty, we reduce unintentional evil, and so make our souls as good as possible. But we cannot think for ourselves if we do not come to know ourselves. Self-knowledge is unteachable, but self-knowledge alone, alone is the grandeur of virtue. Thus is the fundamental paradox of Socrates. Virtue is knowledge, vice is ignorance. Philosophy as a mission. A rash young fan of Socrates consulted the ancient oracle at Delphelti, priestess and mouthpiece of Apollo, the god of reason and proportion. He inquired whether there was anyone in Athens wiser than Socrates, to which the god answered, No. This puzzled Socrates, since he claimed no wisdom, avoiding the confidum bias. He devoted, tested the gods' aversion, only to find many pretenders to wisdom, but none wise. His search was an education to the noble youth of Athens, but it also meant exposing for epistemic overreaches, whether their status or reputation. Socrates made enemies. In dialogue, Socrates required the individual to have achieved consequence in the search for truth. For this confirmed claims, he discovered the soul. Taylor, following Burnett, said he created the conception of the soul, doomed ever since in Western mythology, philosophy. Justin Meyer, 2nd century BC, considered Socrates a Christian before Christ, and many other ancient philosophers, Plato, for example, claimed Socrates as their forebearer. And that is just a small bit on the first bit of knowledge. Also a bit about Socrates and his past. We're now going to go move on to conjective bias. The moron and the mechanic. We've all been there. You're late for work and in a hurry. But on the drive you get caught behind a slow coach who doesn't even know how to get out the way. We've all been there. You're driving along sensibly, lawfully, when some maniac storms up behind you, impatient but unable to pass. pass. So they are on your bumper tailgating. Yet another dangerous driver. We always find ourselves behind a moron and in front of a maniac. The driver ahead is a moron. We are the newer. We are never the maniac. The driver behind is a maniac. We are never the moron. Our speed is always the correct speed to be going. Amidst the conduct character of the engaged mind, busy about its daily business, we find our preferential reversed explanations of what is going on around us. We explain people's behaviour by attribution clause. For example, we brain, we make excuses. Even if only in the science of our private thoughts, philosophists have explored what philosophers have long lambered. Our tendency to divide and misjudge poorly and miscontribute cause. The mind is a basic instrument, and those who would use it without taking confidently precautions are at consistent disadvantage. We must use our flaw tool in order to correct our flaw tool. A whiskey will prop position.
as in the example that I've just spoken, we make personal attributions to explain the behaviour of others. We implung their motives and scornfully label them, but we make situational adjustments in our own course. Duty beckons, speed limits are in force. Our over attributions of professional and integrational factors in the case of other people's behaviours, by downplaying the external demands they are under, is a tendency so persistent that it has been called the fundamental attribution error, and even hailed as a cornerstone of science social psychology. In expanding our own behaviours, we often demonstrate a self-serving bias. As the example of the maniac versus the idiot driver also institutes whether outcomes are positive, we attribute it to our virtues, our intelligence, or generally our competence. When outcomes are negative, we appeal to the circumstances. I passed the test because I'm so smart. I failed the test, but it was tricky or unfair. A relatively fancy of dual explanation is age old. When things go wrong, we hold others accountable for outcomes. We point to their incompetence, but excuse ourselves by good intuitions. I did the best I could. Subsequent research has shown that age and culture influences the incidence of these errors. Broadly speaking, those from East Asia cultures commit fundamentally less errors or none at all. The Japanese show little self-serving bias. These differences may only be due to a greater rate of seditional attribution in general, or even to more redoubtable, or suchable, self-indelicacy. Bibliological indifferences may even switch attribution styles according to the content. Okay guys, that's it for now. A little bit of philosophy, as I said, a bit different. I'm going to be doing quite a bit more of these. I'm going to be looking at the differences of doubt as well in the Eastern philosophies to point out the doubt that they have. Also going to go into a bit of Plato as well and all his ideas, his metaphors, his backstory, his history. We'll be also looking into problem solving as well later down the line. There are many, many Western uh, doubts as well. We'll be looking at Western ideas, lots of uh, old stuff, lots of new stuff, looking at problems as well and how to deal with them, moving further and further on. Until next time, this is Dave. Knowledge is power. Use it well.